Oh my God! So I'm sitting beside fun. Ming Tsao. I have to tell you, I have never sung that song in front of a French-speaking audience, so this was really exciting and nerve-wracking for me. Thank you so much for knowing. Well, all yeah. those jump rope chants have obviously paid off. What do you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you feel being considered such an icon, such a legend, such an underground superstar? I tell you, from being a lonely little kid, it is really a big change, and it's so sweet. It's nice. I, mean, I live very simply. I do not live like an icon. I don't walk around like this. <laughs> But it's, it's very nice. It's incredibly gratifying, and it's very humbling at well, the same time. Were you a performer as a child at all? I was um, dramatic. <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, I mean, I wasn't really, I didn't really have much of identity as a child. I was a bundle of emotions. That's all I was, was emotions. I didn't have likes or dislikes. I just had fears and hates and scared. You know, I mean, I was just, I was more um, an emotional child than an actual sentient being. <laughs> I mean, I was smart at spell. My mother used to trot me out to spell Birmingham for her friends, which isn't really that hard. But I didn't really have, um, you know, I was, I was, yeah, no. <laughs> if there were to be a biopic now done about you, who would play you? Well, I used to think Anne Hish. <laughs> because she's nuts and she sort of looks like me. Yeah. yeah. What happened to her? I have no idea. She's probably somewhere in a hospital. No, she, no, she had no mean. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Um, she, she was pro she's probably, she had a TV series a few years ago, but I have no idea where she's been. We, I've never met her. So. I used to think before that I thought Jodie Foster, but she's too old now. <laughs> well, I mean, just, you know, to start to be, you know, to play me as a child. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm still very, very, very young. Know, but anyway, so. Okay. Mink, uh, I would like to play a game with you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Since we are not showing any of the movie excerpts, mm -hmm. and you do have such terrific lines in these oh. movies. Yeah, I got some good ones. It's true. Okay. I would like to read off some of the lines and have you complete them. I will do my best. <laughs> And then you have to say what they're from. Oh, okay. Okay. And I, I will not be trying to impersonate you. <laughs> those lines, I will try and do it with a straight face. What about my life? Do you get an allowance to pay for that? I know you were trying to kill me. Uh, that's, uh, is that I hate you, I hate the Supreme Court, go, yes. go tell your mother. Yes. I hate you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty close. It's from Desperate Living. Yes. Yes, it is. Go tell your mother I hate you. <laughs> don't tell me I don't know what Vietnam is like. Number <laughs> two. <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah, one on one. Somebody called me a neuter. And you know what? I didn't mind. <laughs> if being... Something means, so I'm proud. Uh, it's something about being proud to be a neuter. I'm a neuter and I'm proud, yes. It's, it's from um, uh, the very last one I did. Um, Dirty Shame, thank you. <laughs> I think I have to get rid of this. <laughs> I am such a slob. I'm happy though. Go ahead. I couldn't remember the exact line, no. Close enough. <laughs> I wouldn't suck your lousy oh! dick. If I was suffocating and there was oxygen in your balls. <laughs> Cookie Mueller and I, one night were out in New York. This was many, many years ago and we started getting hassled by a couple of guys. And I turned to them and I said that <laughs> and they ran. <laughs> I will if you really want me to. Yeah. I think you should stand up. Stand up and deliver it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. 
going to hold on. Hold the microphone for me because it was sort of the I yes. had like a posture right. Yeah. You know, Taffy had a posture. Right? Yes. And I think my hands were twisted. I wouldn't suck your lousy dick if I was suffocating and there was oxygen in your ball. for word. <laughs> that one's hard to forget, plus I signed that on photographs. <laughs> uh, last one. Mm -hmm. It's very long. Okay. <laughs> I love you even more than my own filthiness. More than my hair color. More than the sounds of bone break, bones breaking. More than the sounds of death, of the death rattle. Even my, more than my own shit do I love you, Raymond. <laughs> Oh my God. Yes, I did know that one. To bring it back to Cookie Mueller, tell us about her. I mean, she was such a free spirit. And... She, Cookie was amazing. And there is a book out called Edgewise. And you really need to read it because it's not only about, it's about all of us when we were younger. And, I mean, it, it's about Cookie. But you know, Susan's in it, I'm in it. And there's a lot in it about, you know, our early years together as friends. and. It's, it's really hard because Cookie was many things to many people. And so to me, she was like a sister um, who was really annoying a lot of the times. Because my si I, mean, I have six sisters, and all of them are annoying at times. So, uh, and three brothers who are equally annoying at times. So, I mean, we had a, we had, a, there was, I will tell you a very quick story. <laughs> um, how much time do we have? No, I'll tell you a very quick story. The summer of 1968, and I'm not going to go into all of it because the whole, there's just too much, but Cookie, Cookie and Susan Lowe, who plays Mole in Desperate Living, and I were sharing a little cottage in Provincetown. And I was the only one that had a job. I worked in a toy store, a very difficult place. <laughs> and Cookie was selling drugs, because that's how Cookie lived. Uh, <clears throat> And Susan was just out. She was just a mess. They finally threw her out of town for sitting on the steps of the post office in shorts with no underpants. <laughs> and I, she claims to have been turning tricks. I don't know. But anyway, we were, and I would come home from a very hard day at the toy store. <laughs> and Susan and Cookie would be sitting in the kitchen with a big jug of wine, putting tattoos on themselves. And you know, I mean, so it's. And I'm blank. I'm a total blank. I've never had a tattoo. I never will have a tattoo. So unless somebody does it without my knowledge when I'm asleep some night, I, I fear that. I wake up thinking, oh my god, I'm going to have a tattoo. Because uh, I really don't want one thing. I only have one hole in each ear. I am so straight. But when I, when I pierced my ears, it was a big deal. You know, see, we didn't have malls. We didn't have places to go. It's not that it's fine. Like that, I had to put a potato behind my ears and put an actual brooch. I mean, I, I, I you know, I used the, the back of a brooch to pierce my ear. So you guys, it's so easy. I walked uphill both ways to school in the snow every day. So, okay, where we? But anyway, Cookie is much too complicated a character for me to talk about. Get the book; it's brilliant. It's really good. Uh, brushing on to, um, you know, getting your ears pierced in the old days, I want to ask you, you've been called upon to play a lot of sort of really straight-laced, you know, yes. lady down the street kind of characters. Yep, yeah. And in, if, if method acting is something <laughs> that we're to talk about, this should be a, a part of you somewhere. Well, it is. I mean, I grew up in a very, very conservative neighborhood of Baltimore. I mean, Baltimore is a politically progressive city, so when I say conservative, I mean visually. And, and you know, I mean, we were... <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, socially, we're, we're a socially progressive city in many ways. And my mother was a Democrat, so I mean, it wasn't that kind of conservative. But I mean, for us, it was important that your knee highs matched your sweater, and the pennies in your loafers were turned face up. I mean, that's, this, these were important things. I mean, so I grew up in a, in a pretty conservative that way neighborhood. So I have that. I mean, I've never been, I played a housewife once, 
I mean, I, I played at being one a couple of times. I've lived with a couple of guys. I'm not real good at it. <laughs> I don't love cleaning, and I do prepare my own food, but I did serve a half raw meatloaf once, so. Because <laughs> I got stoned and forgot about the time. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not real good at all that. But I do, I mean, I mean, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about working with Divine. I mean, Divine was the first in so many ways, and now drag is so almost normal. You know, I met Divine at a party. Uh, I mean, I met John, and then John introduced me to Divine and to David and to Mary Vivian Pierce, who's the only person in all of our club, in all of our little dream language, that I've never had a solo scene with. I never had a solo scene with Mary Vivian Pierce. I just thought about that today. She lives in Nicaragua, by the way. You now she's still alive, but she lives in Nicaragua. She comes home for Christmas. Um, working with Divine, I met Divine at a party, and he was, you know, draped in, in a sheet. We were all we were all taking acid. We took acid all the time. <laughs> I mean, it was a regular regular Saturday night ritual. I mean, got it from Johns Hopkins, so it was good. <laughs> no speed in it. So, um, and he was you know, draped in a sheet and lip syncing to something or other with a little dog, a little Yorkie in his hand. And, and I was, he intimidated me always. I have to say, I was very impressed with Divine. Divine had, a, I'm going to say this is going to sound so weird, he was extremely generous. He had a huge appetite, not just for food, which was obvious, but you know, I like to eat myself. But he had an appetite for life that was so big, and it took him everywhere. You know, he said yes to everything. He, he, and it, it was just kind of amazing to me. So, uh, and I, I was not around him during any of his musical career. I was not around him. I mean, I saw him perform in nightclubs. But he was wonderful to work with because he was present. He was absolutely present in scenes that I had with him. He wasn't looking to see that his angle was better or that he was in front of the camera or you know, that the light was better on him or any of those things. When we had scenes together, he and I were in that scene for real. And I have worked with so many actors who don't do that. You know, they're, all, they're so concerned about other things and they want to they be the standout in the scene. You know, and they don't care if they're not giving you your lines right. They don't care if they're not looking at you. They don't care if they're not relating to you. Because, it's, and, and with Divine, it was always about what the two of, what we were doing together. I loved working with him. Absolutely loved working with him. Do you think he'd be proud of the legacy he's left? In oh my right? God, are you kidding me? Of course he would be. And I worked on stage with Divine as well. We worked together with the Cockettes in San Francisco back in the early 70s. Divine before me, but we did a show together called Vice Palace. And um, where I sing one of the songs that's on my album called No Nose No Dog. The album. Uh, we have the album for sale, by the way. Um, <laughs> just some shameless plugging. Uh, you don't have to buy it, but it's lovely if you do. Uh, but anyway, but we, we did a play once called it was, I forget what it was actually called, what we called it, but it was, a, it was a, an old play called Ladies in Retirement that I think they renamed for something because of the rights. Because <laughs> we were not, you know, we didn't have the rights. And Divine played an old woman who was fascinated by some stones. <laughs> and, you know, with a hair in a gray bun, no glamour makeup, and he was brilliant. So, I mean, I've, I've, you know, he was a really good actor. And I, you know, it's, like I said earlier, it's a shame that he didn't get to go on and, and become the actor that people would have recognized. Yeah. Patrick, do you have one more question? We're going to open things up to the audience. I think we should open it up to the audience right Ooh. now. If anyone wants to come up, don't be shy and come over here. It's hard to see hands because the lights oh, are in We've got eyes. someone here. I see you. What's your name? Esther. Hi, Esther. It's not actually a question. I have a present for you. Oh. <laughs> This is like, my friend couldn't be here actually because he's drawing a comic about Cookie and Miller. Oh, so fabulous! He made a comic about Dirty Shane and you're in it. That's like you hanging out the window right there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. That's very, very kind of you. That's and tell your friend thank you for me. That's very sweet. What's your friend's name? Um, his name is Rick Trembles. He's a local cartoonist. Shout very cool. Friend. I am very pleased. Thank you so much. Okay. Hi, what's your name? Yeah. Great name. I'm sorry, what's your name? I'm busy with my costume. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good name. Uh, I think 
you have a great in hairspray. Thank you. Small but strong and no more behind better than you. Um, and I'm glad you said Taffy Davenport was like your favorite. We still watch it with friends. That's not mine with friends. It's good lines. John wrote me some good ones for that. Yeah, it was right in the middle before the right here in the middle of the or stuff. And the later in the middle, like, so the boys stuff. You never talked about Edith Massey at all? Oh, I didn't oh. talk about Edith Massey. I'm sorry, because she was a big part of our family. And I was, we met Edith Massey. She was tending bar in this waterfront neighborhood in Baltimore called Fells Point, which was, uh, you know, um, was the waterfront. And it was, it was still the funky waterfront. It's now a big tourist area and blah, blah, blah. And there's an aquarium and all this you know, fancy stuff. But if any of you watched Homicide Life on the Streets, um, where the police station was, that's kind of Fells Point. And but we met her, she was working in this bar, this, this really, it was a beer and shot bar. And back, and this was the 60s, so you have to remember. But you could get drunk on a dollar, literally. Oh, so jealous. You know, I know. I know. A shot was like a quarter. Oh. I mean, this, this was, I mean, even back then. That What's was the cheap. address? It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> And Edith was tending bar in there. We had some friends that lived upstairs, and they said, you've got to come and meet this woman. And Edith would tell them, hi, hon, hi, hon. And she would, every now and then, if she'd get drunk enough, she'd whip out one of those tits and like, <laughs> lay it on the bar for a good look at. It's like, please put that away. <laughs> but Edith was very sweet. She was, she had a street smart, but she, but she wasn't real <laughs> smart. But she loved being a movie star. She, was, she thought everybody knew who she was, even if they had never seen any film that she was in. And she just waved to people, hi, hi. And, and she learned her lines phonetically. I mean, when she's going, hi, Stu, Ben, hi, I mean, she, those words she understood. We did so many takes. In, during uh, Female Trouble, of Edith in that cage, we, you know, when we were talking, she couldn't get the line out. And if, you, if she didn't get the, well, there was no cutting back then. Everything was done in master shots. You had to start at the beginning of the scene and finish at the end of the scene. And if she and she blew that line. She, I forget which line it was, but it was like 30 takes, 35 takes. And John's very nice at the beginning, and by the end he's getting, you know, testier and testier, which makes her more and more nervous. She finally got it out and we finished the scene, but it was just like, please say it right. Because by the time she gets her line perfect, I'm exhausted. <laughs> no, she, she was great. I happened to be in Spain um, in 84, I think, 83, I think. And I, um, I was traveling around Europe every, um, for a long time. I, had a, I, I mean, on vacation, I was traveling. And I would get a letter from John in every major city. You know, I'd go to, um, you would have to go to American Express and pick up your mail and I would go. To, it was a big ritual for me to go to American Express. And there's always a letter from John. And I once got this, you know, I was in Barcelona and I got this big envelope. And I thought, oh, yay, it's a new script. Something good is happening. I opened it up and it was all obituaries of Edith because I, I, mean, I was so sad. I was really, really sad. But what was interesting is that Pink Flamingos was actually playing in Barcelona that day. So I went to see it. And it was it was in English dubbed in Spanish, so I got to say goodbye to Edith my own way in Barcelona, Spain. So Hi. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to the difference when you were sort of just a smaller dreamliner who moving into those bigger productions where you had like Johnny Depp coming in and bigger and like oh, other Johnny Depp. <laughs> but just that sort of what it must have been like to come from a little tight knit group to a bigger Well it was it, we got food. <laughs> we got food and we got paid. And these were, I mean, that, literally, those were the biggest differences. Because when we started out, there was no food, there were no crafts services on the set. Sometimes somebody would run out for subs. Uh, but, I mean, you know, there was, there was no, you know, John would come around and pick everybody up in the morning and then, then you know, we'd have to stick around until the filming was done. And then he'd drive us home again. Yeah, I mean, we had no, I mean, it was, the, the budgets were minuscule. So, uh, so when we, after, after Hairspray, which was the first union movie, which I, you know, I, I got to join the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, actually, I had to join the Screen Actors Guild. It was mandatory. Um, but they pay my health insurance. <laughs> 
So, uh, you know, so it was fun. I mean, Johnny Depp wasn't as big then as he is now. I mean, basically he had 21 Jump Street. You know, I mean, he was really, really, really cute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. He called me Auntie Mink. <laughs> Just to make sure I knew. <laughs> it's hard not to salivate. <laughs> But I mean, you know, the, the, the difference was budget, the difference was money, you know, and also being able to do retakes and being able to do uh, and cutaway shots, which we hadn't had before. I mean, so every, I mean, basically everything changed, but, but it was still, uh, it's, you know, it, you know, whether I was working or not, I was always welcome on set, I could, you know, and I would hang out with, you know, behind the scenes, I'd hang out in what they call uh, Cinema Village, you know, so to watch the scenes being filmed. I mean, I generally didn't go to the set if I wasn't working, because that's just sort of lame. But, <laughs> unless there was press. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but, I mean, that, that was the biggest difference, and I adored David Nelson. David Nelson was just this calm, so calm. You know, I mean, you know, with, with, with um, I mean, I just, he was like a, a old, strong, sturdy tree that you just wanted to sit under in the shade. He was really, so I mean, you know, I was, but mainly, I mean, budget. That's, that's the principal thing. And, you know, with budget came money. <laughs> and plus, I wasn't living in Baltimore then. I left Baltimore in 1977. I moved to New York. I was there for 12 years. Then I moved to LA. I was there for 18. So I moved back to Baltimore eight years ago. But there were, so I would get hotels. So, you know, it was, it was, you know, spirit. But the spirit was the same. The spirit's always, it's always John's, you know, and John's sense of humor rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there one more question? Oh, please. <laughs> Hi, Mike. What was it like working with uh, Debbie Harry and her spray? Were you jealous of her amazing hair? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Debbie, jealous of Debbie Harry for a lot of reasons. <laughs> She's had an amazing, you know, she's, the woman can sing and can write music and do all those things. She's, she's kind of amazing. She's very nice. I, I didn't really work with her. I mean, we were on the set at the same time and we didn't really have scenes together. And a movie set is such that you really, if you're not actually working with a person, you you're don't really get to spend time with them. You know, not, it's not like everybody sits around in this big room and everybody's all chatting. It's, you know, people go to their, their dressing rooms and they spend time there. So, um, and I, you know, I see her every now and then. I saw her, you know, she came out to LA when I was still there and performed and I saw her there. And I mean, we're always very friendly. You know, I'm always glad to see her, but I don't really know her. Tell me one last follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> um, the lines, is it all John Waters? Are you following an exact script? How much have you I told you that. Were you not paying attention? <laughs> Very specifically, he wrote every word, every period, every comma, every ex every exclamation point, and there are a lot of those. Yeah. He wrote every single word. Yes. Wow. Okay, Mick. The last question: What type of legacy do you hope to make? Oh, I just want people to laugh. I love making people laugh. Actually, what I'd really like to leave—the legacy I really want to leave—to be totally honest with you, I want people to go, "Wow, she could really sing." <laughs> That's true. Oh my God. Woo! I would like people to say that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ming. Thank you guys for coming. Thank We're going to do merci, a meet and greet. Merci, 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 merci. We'll be doing a meet and greet, and you can buy her a CD. Let's hear it for Ming Stoll, everybody.